Hi, I'm Matt Ingenthrone from Couchbase, and with me today is Graham Popel, uh, also with Couchbase. Uh, today, we're going to talk you through all you need to know about multi-document asset transactions in Couchbase. Uh, quick note, this is part one of a two-part uh, presentation. So if you're already familiar with transactions, you may want to go ahead and look in the agenda for part two and jump there, but you might want to stick around just a little bit to learn what's new with 7.0. Uh, before you jump on. But if you're new to how we do transactions with Couchbase, uh, this is the right place to be. So with that, uh, today we're going to talk about what's new in 7.0, a little bit about the case for transactions, how you can express yourself with everything in Couchbase, and a little bit about durability and isolation. Now let me hand it over to Graham, who's going to give you a little bit of an introduction in what's new in 7.0. Thanks, Matt. So in this session, we're going to be taking a look at what's new with transactions in Couchbase 7, uh, starting with the headline feature of support for nickel queries. This adds multi-document SQL-esque functionality to the existing single document key value support. We're also going to look at the improvements to performance that we've made and how the new support for open telemetry trace data provides new levels of insight and transparency into transaction operations, which lets you more easily debug any distributed performance issues. And we're extending our platform support further with the existing Java transaction support now joined by .NET and C++ with other languages in development as I speak. Plus, Couchbase 7 has the ability to initiate a transaction attempt directly from the UI and from command line tools. Uh, so starting with the nickel query support, uh, we have a second presentation that Matt mentioned where we'll be going into more detail on the API and functionality. So here I'll just touch on the high level points. Uh, our transactions already give you strong single document performance with the existing key value interface. And with the new query support, you now have the multi-document utility and power of the Express's SQL compatible language, Nickel. The query support slots right into your existing Couchbase applications, and you can even seamlessly use both query and KV from within the same transaction, as we see in the example. You have access to almost all Nickel DML operations, including selects, inserts, and updates. And of course, you have full asset guarantees, whether you're using KV or query. Uh, as well as being supported from the existing transactions API, as shown in this example, you can now initiate a transaction attempt directly with nickel statements. Uh, so you can also access transactions from the, from the UI and command line shell. Uh, now taking a look at performance and observability. Um, as with nickel, uh, we're going to be doing a deep dive into this in the second presentation. Um, so I'll just touch on the high level points here again. So achieving ACID transactions in a distributed, distributed system like Couchbase without sacrificing speed and performance is non-trivial. But Couchbase transactions gives you the highly performant and completely distributed transactional protocol that gives you the latency and throughput that you need. But that didn't stop us with Couchbase 7 from putting that protocol under the microscope and seeing if we could refine it still further. So along with a number of uh, smaller improvements, uh, we were able to reduce per transaction metadata rights by 25% with no change in functionality. With smaller transa transactions, that will translate to around a 15% improvement in latency. Along with this, we are rolling out support for open telemetry. Now, distributed systems are notoriously complex to debug. Hardware can go wrong, network switches can be slow, nodes can fail, and all of this can happen at any time. We believe open telemetry is an important part of the solution. Our integration with it allows analyzing transaction performance at a new level of granularity and transparency. And we'll be taking an in-depth look in the second presentation at how we solve real-world performance problems using it. And we're rolling out to new platforms with the existing Java implementation now joined by .NET and C++ and other languages underway currently, and a familiar interface uniting them all. And now back to Matt. Great, thank you, Graham. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the use case for transactions. Now, um, generally speaking, you know, developers think transactions, I need transactions, right? Well, in, in the case of Couchbase, uh, and this is true actually with a lot of databases, you might want to think about some of the overhead and uh, that comes with uh, using transactions. So let's talk a little bit about when you're building an application against Couchbase, what is the natural state of data for an application? Really, here in the modern world, uh, we don't uh, always you know, come up with a you know, fourth normal form for our data, a perfect schema that's going to be driven uh, exactly by the real world. Instead, what we tend to do 
uh, is we tend to have data that's driven by that application. Uh, a developer sits down in an IDE, has a high-level uh, object model in whatever uh, language that, the, that they're using, and then with a the document database, it maps pretty easily to the system underneath. You'll take those high-level objects and map them down to uh, JSON objects. Now, that actually, Catchbase is one of those document databases that actually gives us uh, some performance and some reliability advantages, especially if we're talking about a distributed system. Uh, it is true that we have repetition of data, but here in the modern world, you know, where, where terabyte disks are, are, are the norm, if you're having some denormalization down to the document level, that's actually useful from both a performance and reliability perspective. Uh, so we could talk a lot more about uh, normalization in a, another venue or another time, but just kind of accept that as, as the way the world tends to work these days is people build applications, as developers build applications from that object model and then store the data inside the database. Now, one of the advantages of that uh, is that you uh, can actually extend the data model. Uh, so you may be able to extend the data model to add a few other things, a new version of the application. Uh, and uh, as an application developer, you don't have to go get a DBA to run a database migration, modify the underlying data. You just need to be able to add those new fields to the document object model underneath and then map that directly to the newer version. Sometimes you'll do that with uh, defaults in the case that uh, maybe an older version of the document doesn't have a field that you want to use. Now, there are some problems, however. Ultimately, you can't denormalize everything into a single document, right? You eventually need to spread things across multiple documents. And sometimes that data duplication and inconsistency can become a little bit too much. Uh, you, you certainly want to, um, you wouldn't want to have a, a complete copy of the team uh, in every player's document. So what I'm showing here is on the game sim uh, sample, uh, which we, we've used in a, uh, some of our examples, the, I, I may have a team and that team is uh, uh, underlying, is, has a set of players. I could try to put them all in there, but then eventually that document's going to get to be too big. Really, I do need an ability to split some things out into separate documents. Um, also, this kind of denormalization actually sometimes makes data access a little worse when you're trying to query it. Um, so that's not necessarily negative, right? It's there are times when it makes sense to denormalize, and then there, uh, there are times that it makes sense to normalize a little further. I should mention that in the case that you do denormalize, that you do you are working with a single document, Couchbase always uh, document updates are always atomic. You do have some additional tools in the case of sub document operations against docs. Uh, and then we have a few things that are kind of designed for a distributed system where you have lots of concurrent operations. We have optimistic concurrency with CAS, uh, which is a, a method of making sure that you know, if two people are trying to change a document at the same time, one is going to succeed and the other is going to fail uh, with a, a check and set uh, of metadata and make sure it's the same uh, document that you're changing. We also have pessimistic concurrency with locks. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're not perfect locks, they're, uh, but they're certainly useful for these kinds of things where you might traverse an object graph and you want to acquire locks on the way down and then release those locks as you make changes. That said, um, sometimes when you're denormalizing, you want to move from uh, a relational RDBMS to a uh, Couchbase as a document database. And... Uh, frequently, you can actually denormalize from that RDBMS to a single document. Uh, and Couchbase already allows that kind of normalization or denormalized data model, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, in the case of Couchbase, if you do need to pull the documents back together at the time of retrieving the uh, document to show, uh, to present it to a user, uh, Couchbase's support in Nickel for join allows you to do those kinds of joins across multiple documents and, uh, and represent that data, you know, project that data in, in whatever um, uh, format that you want to. Uh, so Couchbase is great for those kinds of RDBMS transitions as well. That said, the big new feature here is Couchbase Transactions. So with Couchbase Transactions, really what we're doing is we're giving the developer the ability to have all or nothing uh, update semantics from Couchbase for durably modifying multiple documents, even while they're distributed across multiple nodes on a cluster. 
And so we're really proud of the fact that we've been able to add this kind of functionality to Couchbase to deliver on top of all the existing functionality, all the existing ease of programming, uh, the ability to uh, wrap the kinds of uh, document changes you might have in a transaction. So when you start talking about transactions, you inevitably come across the term ACID, right? Uh, ACID is uh, an acronym that is uh, synonymous with transactions. Uh, it was coined over 30 years ago, and it was really kind of uh, an acronym that, that came from monolithic RDBMSs. So there's really, technically speaking, no formal definition for what ACID means in a distributed database, um, but application developers expect the kind of behavior that they get from a traditional RDBMS when working with uh, Couchbase. So what does ACID mean, right? If you, if you look at the acronym, uh, of course, it's, it's useful to, that it turns into a regular word, but the idea here is that you have atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Uh, atomicity and durability are pretty much binary. You either have them or you don't, right? I'm either atomically changing all of these documents or I'm not. I'm individually changing them, and you can uh, see the side effects, if you will, as another uh, another actor in, in the uh, concurrency model. And durability, you know, I either have something as durable or not. Um, Couchbase actually uh, goes a little bit further with durability, as I'll talk, off, talk about later. Uh, we actually have durability with a few different options. Then you start talking about consistency and isolation. And these are frequently kind of um, uh, misunderstood terms. So with consistency, that really implies that the integrity of all the related data uh, is maintained. In Couchbase, we automatically maintain consistency when a transaction is performed. Some, copy, some artifacts, such as replica copies, are immediately consistent. Other artifacts, like indexes and XCCR, are eventually consistent with respect to the data mutation itself. But then we have the ability for you as a developer to specify whether or not you need to be consistent with something when you're, say, issuing a query after making a, a, a modification. Isolation really kind of pertains to concurrency and defines how transactions become visible to other different uh, actors inside a concurrent system. Uh, so uh, things, various different databases such as Oracle, SQL Server, and Postgres have chosen to di implement different levels of isolation and frequently you may actually tune to a particular level of isolation or uh, specify it when uh, starting a transaction. But, but what Couchbase provides is read committed isolation. And technically, we go a little further than that into what we call, um, or what is called, monotonic atomic view isolation. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So before we go there, I want to talk a little bit about expressing yourself, right? Your developers, you want to see how uh, you express yourself against uh, Couchbase. So uh, one of the cool things with what we're delivering in 7.0 is we have increasing levels of expression. Uh, so the first one is really just working with multiple documents. Obviously, when you're doing a transaction, you're working with multiple documents in almost all cases. You're uh, constantly modifying multiple documents, and you want those atomically changed. So with, what you see here on the code sample on the right-hand side is uh, a user retrieving a couple of documents and then uh, modifying one of them and, uh, re and replacing uh, one of them inside the system. So uh, in Couchbase, you already have multi-document, and this is kind of analogous to what you would have in a, uh, a traditional relational database as multiple statements. You know, I'm, I'm retrieving multiple documents. I, I start a transaction, I retrieve multiple documents, uh, and then I, um, I will uh, store that back to the system and replace it back to the system, uh, put a new one and replace another one. You can also, starting in 7.0, have multiple statements. So I can have multiple nickel statements where I'm doing an update. So this is using the travel sample database, which ships uh, with Couchbase. And you, in this case, what you're seeing is we're doing a select from the database. And then we may do some, uh, take uh, some subset of that, maybe even mutate it in high level uh, code and then uh, do an update statement, and I want all of that to work atomically. This is actually part of where our MAV isolation comes into place. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But the other cool thing is platform integrated. 
So say, for example, I want to be able to run a transaction. This is a more complete example. I'm showing the transactions Lambda, uh, which Graham will talk more about in part two of this presentation. In the transactions Lambda, uh, I am able to run a select statement. Uh, and then maybe I have some sort of uh, library that I've pulled in that provides machine learning API. And I'm going to take the, the existing trained machine learning model, and I'm going to update it with the most recent information, run that through that machine learning model, and then I want to do an update of a set of documents based on that logic. I can do those kinds of things with what Couchbase provides in transactions, that platform integrated ability to have multi-document, multi-statement, platform level integrated uh, changes of multiple documents in a transaction. Okay, so let's talk briefly just about uh, two other items. One is uh, durability and uh, the other is isolation. So in Couchbase, you actually have the ability to tune your durability. We offer three different levels of durability. Um, the way I like to think about this is if you think about your uh, uh, traditional database, it's a monolith, right? It's, it's either uh, you're durable if you're putting it on the spinning rust on the disk inside it uh, or not. But as soon as you start talking about a distributed system where I have multiple computers, multiple disks, what does durability actually mean in that environment? And so what we have in uh, Couchbase is multiple durability levels. And this is just a, a brief example of for a given transaction, I may decide that, you know, I'm my paranoia level, my, my, my uh, concern about my business risk that I'm going to take for the kinds of changes I'm making with this. It's good enough if it's in memory in three locations um, or uh, the majority of locations, I should say, depending on the size of my cluster and the number of replicas. Um, I may also decide to up that paranoia level. I may decide I want to persist to the majority, uh, persist uh, to master, uh, and uh, otherwise in memory on majority. Uh, I may also want to go to what you see here on the screen, which is the highest level, which is persist to majority. So I want to make sure it's in memory and on disk on multiple nodes before I return control back to the application. One of the other things that Catchbase offers is a higher level of isolation. We offer MAV isolation. What MAV isolation, monotonic atomic view isolation, uh, gives you is the ability for your transaction to ensure that it's going to, if it sees part of a, uh, a uh, transaction that's committed, it will see all of those uh, transaction committed changes to make sure that if another actor is changing things and your logic depends on those changes, you're not going to be partway between the transactions. So with that, I wanna thank you for uh, sticking through part one of this presentation. We do have uh, a couple of resources for you, a uh, link to the transactions documentation and the game sim demo code from which I pulled most of the examples that were shown earlier in these slides. Uh, if you'd like, look for part two, where we'll show some of this in action in some demonstrations. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Ingenthrone from Couchbase, and with me is Graham Popel. Uh, and this is part two of all you need to know about multi-document ACID transactions. In this uh, section, we're gonna go mostly into demonstration through code, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Couchbase transactions with Nickel, show some code, uh, show how it operates. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about observability and performance and how you're able to observe your application running with Couchbase transactions and understand how it performs. Um, if you are coming to this session first, there is a part one. You can look in the agenda to find part one. Part one is more of an overview and introduction to transactions in general. This one assumes that you already are familiar with Couchbase transactions and you're just looking to see the meat of how we operate. So with that, let me turn it over to Graham. So uh, leaping straight in here, um, one of Couchbase's core strengths is that it allows the application developer to combine the performance of the single document key value interface, which we already have, uh, with the utility of the multi-document nickel interface uh, that we're adding in Couchbase 7, um, swapping between them as required and leveraging the strengths of both. Um, so you've got access now to pretty much the full power and expressiveness of Nickel uh, with support for, for most DML statements, updates, selects, inserts, and so on. 
Um, we're going to leap into uh, an in-depth example of the API uh, shortly, um, but the main takeaway is that uh, we've extended the existing programming model that you're already familiar with uh, and seamlessly integrated Nickel query support into that uh, with an API that's going to be familiar to anyone that's uh, performed a query using the existing SDKs. Uh, so with Couchbase 7, um, there are now two ways to initiate uh, a transaction. The first is with the transactions library uh, that we can see here on the left. Uh, here you provide your full transactional logic in a Lambda method, uh, and the library can retry that as needed in order to handle any error situations, uh, such as uh, write-write conflicts with other transactions. It also uh, allows you to mix KV and Nickel operations in the same transaction, and it's the recommended approach for application developers. You can also now initiate a transaction using uh, a nickel begin transaction statement. Um, so this provides an interface that will be familiar to SQL developers. Uh, and the main strength of this approach is that it can be used from the, uh, the UI, uh, the REST interface, and command line tools. So uh, throughout this presentation, I'll be focusing on the transactions library approach, the one on the left. Um, if you're interested in the approach on the right, uh, please see uh, Kame's uh, Connect presentation, Couchbase makes Nickel acidic for more details on that. Uh, both approaches use the same underlying protocol and are 100% compatible. So uh, right, right conflicts between the two are safely detected and handled. Uh, so now let's take a look at the API in detail. Uh, I'm going to be using Nickel uh, within a transaction to solve a problem that couldn't be handled before the release of Couchbase 7, uh, which is the need to atomically update denormalized data across multiple documents, uh, which is a scenario that uh, many developers here may already be familiar with. Um, I'll be using the travel sample example data. Let's uh, start by taking a look at that. Uh, so one of the great new features in Couchbase 7 is uh, support for scopes and collections uh, that let you group your data in a much more granular way uh, than you could before. Uh, so the travel sample uh, uh, bucket has an inventory scope uh, that contains multiple collections. Uh, and the two that we're going to be interested in today are airlines and routes. Uh, so airlines are pretty straightforward. Uh, they've got an ID and they've got a, a two-letter a two -letter IATA code uh, Q5 here. Um, and the scenario that we're going to be addressing here is that we want to update the IATA code for an airline. Uh, in, in reality, IATA codes don't update very often, so it's not a particularly realistic example, but uh, just for demonstration purposes. Um, so we've got airlines and we've also got routes. Um, so a route goes between a source and a destination airport, uh, and it's on a particular airline. Uh, so the issue that we've got that we're going to be addressing here with Nickel is that uh, uh, routes have, um, for performance reasons, have uh, partially denormalized uh, the airline data. So they've copied some fields from the airline. Um, you've got both the airline ID and you've got the airline IATA code as well. So if we ever need to update this code, uh, we also need to be updating all of the routes that uh, contain this airline as well. Um, so this is something that we can now do with Nickel. Um, and uh, let's have a look at what this would look like in the API. Uh, so it's very simple. Um, we've got the transactional Lambda that you might already be familiar with. Um, the objective with the Lambda is that you put all of your uh, transactional logic inside the Lambda. Uh, and then the transactions library can retry that uh, as necessary. Uh, so it will use this to handle various error scenarios, such as a, a write-write conflict with another transaction. Um, so here we're using the existing key value uh, API that's already there. Uh, we're getting a document, we're replacing the document, and we're changing the IATA uh, airline code on that document. Um, and then what's new here is that we can now perform uh, a nickel query inside a transaction. Uh, and anyone that's used the uh, Java SDK um, or uh, any of the existing SDKs uh, is going to find this very familiar. It's a very familiar interface. Um, you do a context.query, you provide the statement, and you provide any options. Uh, the options supported are pretty much the same as the as the SDK. So here we're we're passing in um, a couple of positional parameters, um, and it returns back the same query result that you might already be familiar with and used to using. Um, 
So the only real difference from uh, performing a query using the um, regular SDK is that you must take care to use it on the transactional context object here. Uh, so you can't perform it on a on a cluster on a scope object uh, inside the transaction uh, that won't be transactionally aware. Um, so that's pretty much the API. Uh, pretty easy to use, as you can see, pretty familiar. Um, one final thing to show is that uh, this is kind of more of a feature of Couchbase 7. I, I mentioned earlier that you have uh, you have buckets, you have scopes, and you have collections now. Um, so in this example right now, we're, we're writing those out as full. We're providing the full key space with the, that full set of data. Um, that can get a bit cumbersome if you're writing a, a lot of nickel queries. So what we can instead do is take a reference to the inventory scope, uh, which we have up here. So we've taken the bucket, we've asked it to for the inventory scope, and we've got that as a scope object. Uh, we can provide this as the first parameter to context.query. Um, sorry, it's called inventory. And now that allows us to remove uh, the bucket and the scope reference. So we can neaten up our, our nickel queries a little bit there. Uh, so before I want to, before I move on from this example, and hopefully I've demonstrated how easy it is to use, uh, queries inside the, inside a transaction now, uh, before I move on, I just want to stress, um, how integrated, uh, and seamless the integration between KV and query, uh, really is. Um, so for example, it's not shown in this example, but here we are doing a get and a replace. Um, after the replace, the, uh, that, that content is staged. Uh, it's not visible to any other actor, of course. Uh, it will only become visible when the transaction is committed, which only happens when we reach the end of the transaction lambda. Um, and same with the nickel query. After the query, the data is only staged. Um, it is not yet visible to other actors. Um, but because we had this tight integration between uh, KV and query, uh, you're able to do um, read your own writes, for instance, between the two. So if I did a context.query here and did a select of airlines, and that uh, query had a where predicate that included this airline that I'm updating here, um, the query would actually see the staged result um, that I've performed up here. It would see the new IATA code that I've put um, onto that uh, onto that airline. Um, and that's because you have read your own writes uh, uh, seamlessly integrated between the two. Um, and in general, anytime you have KV and query um, interacting on the same document in that way, it should uh, behave exactly how you expect. Um, in addition, uh, query statements inside the transaction are going to perform uh, what we call MAV reads, a monotonic atomic view uh, that Matt covered in uh, presentation one. Um, and of course, you have the full set of asking guarantees, whether you're using uh, KV or query. So there's one final thing to look at with query, and that's single query transactions. Uh, now, in a transaction involving queries, uh, the query service is going to hold on to a small amount of data uh, in memory for every document involved in the transaction. Um, if the transaction is very large, that could potentially exceed the assigned resource limits for the service. Uh, so there's ways around this. You can split up the transaction into multiple smaller ones. You can assign more memory to the query service. But we've also provided another solution, a memory optimized one that we call single query transactions. Uh, so as the name suggests, this lets you perform a single query. So it's really designed to be used mainly with um, bulk insert or update workloads. Uh, we've provided a very simple API here. You just call transactions.query, uh, you pass your statement, and then if you need to, you can get the results of the query back uh, as well. Um, so it's very easy to use. Uh, you may see references to a, a nickel parameter, nickel feature called TX implicit throughout our documentation and other presentations. Uh, it's the same thing. Single query transactions is the same feature uh, with um, added retry based error handling. So uh, scenarios like uh, write write conflicts uh, automatically handled for you. Uh, so uh, that wraps us up for the nickel part of this presentation. Uh, we've seen how you can take the existing single document performance of key value operations and now combine that with the utility of multi-document nickel queries all within the existing programming model and all within uh, the same transaction. Now, let's look at observability and performance. Uh, with Couchway 7, we've analyzed the underlying transactions protocol, looking for anywhere we, where we can uh, trim the fat and deliver further performance. 
And along with a number of smaller improvements, we've managed to reduce metadata rights by 25%, uh, which has particular impact on smaller transactions, where it should give anything up to a 15% latency improvement. Uh, in addition, we now provide full transparency and observability of the underlying operations that have been performed in a transaction via open telemetry data. As you already know, distributed systems can be challenging to diagnose. You can have multiple nodes, networks, hardware, any of which can fail or falter at any time. Uh, open telemetry is the combination of two previous efforts to find a solution to this, open tracing and open census, and it aims to provide metrics and tracing showing exactly how uh, your data and messages are flowing through your distributed system. Uh, we believe it's a key part of the uh, solution. And in this section, we're going to be looking at using our open telemetry integration to solve a real world performance problem. Now, uh, I know Matt has set up a cluster that's simulating a real world configuration fault that he's seen in the past. Um, and let's see if we can use open telemetry to figure out exactly what that is. Uh, all we know at the high level right now is that some of the transactions are much slower than others. Okay, so I've got an open telemetry tracer open here. Um, I'm using Honeycomb, uh, and it's showing open telemetry data that we've captured from a, a bunch of transactions. Uh, so let's take a look and see if we can drill into this data uh, and find uh, what's going wrong. Um, so each point in this heat map is a transaction uh, or a, a, a aggregation of some transactions at that point in time and duration. Uh, and on the left, we had, uh, we've had we got the duration of those transactions. Um, so uh, straight away, we've got some interesting, even before we start looking for the performance issues, we've got some interesting uh, um, insights that are falling out of this data. Uh, we, we can see we've got two broad bands of, uh, of transaction duration, um, and that kind of reveals that we've, we've got an underlying workload where uh, we've got um, some very fast read-only transactions that are just taking uh, a millisecond or two, and then we've got some transactions a little bit slower because they're having to do some mutations. So they're coming in around the five, six millisecond mark. Um, and then uh, what seems to be the performance issue is we've got all these kind of outliers uh, above here, um, kind of going up to the sort of even 30 millisecond mark. But kind of we're, we're looking for an average of around six milliseconds. And we're kind of looking for, for why we have so many transactions coming in well above that level. Um, so before we drill into like some of these bad transactions, let's take a look at uh, one of these healthy transactions and kind of see what, what insight we can get into a transaction uh, with this new open telemetry data that we've exposed. Um, so what we can see here is uh, we've kind of got this tree view here. So we've got a transaction. Uh, it, it took around five milliseconds. And then we've got this uh, really great insight here into every operation that's happening inside that transaction. Um, so I can see it had a single attempt. Um, and if the transaction needed to retry for some reason, and remember that the retries happen automatically, um, if it had needed to retry to handle a write-write conflict, we'd, we'd see that going on um, in this open uh, telemetry data. And now we can drill down into this attempt and kind of see exactly what's going on. Um, so we can see we've got some uh, we've got some replaces and then we've got the commit going on. Um, so we've got a lot of data here. Um, I'm just gonna pull up another transaction real quick. Uh, let's grab this one, for instance. Um, sometimes when when you send so much open telemetry data, uh, particularly when you're on a free plan, some of the spans get dropped. So that was what was going on with that transaction. We were seeing some drop data. Um, so this is more of a complete transaction going on here. Um, and we can see we've got We've got key value operations, we've got gets, we've got uh, replaces, and they're happening around, I don't know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 of a millisecond, pretty fast for the most part. One going on here, 0.6 of a millisecond. Um, and what we've got here is a, a lot of very useful data. So for instance, uh, most of the time, uh, a span should be, uh, um, the, the child span should fill the parent span if that makes sense. And if that's not going on, that can be indicative of, uh, we could have um, some performance issues with the application server. Uh, maybe we've got some garbage collection pauses going on. Uh, maybe we've got an application server service that's a little bit um, under-resourced. Um, maybe it's not quite got enough CPU. And we see a little bit of that going on. Um, there's, there's not much. 
uh, for instance, the user get here is mostly filled with lookup in, it's mostly filled with dispatch to server. We are losing a little bit of time here. So maybe we have some application performance issues that we, we need to investigate. But just from looking at this isolated transaction, I, I'm not getting the feeling that's the main cause of the slowness. It's something to look into, but I don't think we've got our main culprit here. Um, what we do have is a whole wealth of information um, along with all the tree view. You can drill down into these kind of lower level spans. So dispatch to server is one of the most useful spans. It's the uh, the time taken on the wire um, from uh, kind of just before we hand it over to uh, the network library to send on to just after we receive a response back from the network library. Um, and at this level, uh, we've got most the, the most useful information that we can, um, we've got access to almost all the useful performance information that we, we can provide. So we can see, uh, we can see the document ID. We can see the, the collection, uh, durability level, the scope, the bucket. Um, and we can see how long it took, obviously. And we can see the, um, the couchbase node that it went to. Um, so we've got the host name there and we've got the, the IP address there. Uh, and a few other bits and pieces. So, but we've got a lot of performance data there. So this can be a really useful um, uh, starting point for trying to sort of find uh, where the performance issues are. So what I'm going to do is, is plug exactly that in. I'm going to start looking. We're looking at transaction uh, spans at the moment. So let's instead have a look at that dispatch to server span. Um, we're going to have a look at the... Uh, no, we'll leave it at heat map for now and just have a play with this data and see what drops out. So for the most part, this is kind of, in, uh, this is pretty similar to the heat map that we just saw. We're seeing most of these dispatch to service spans are clustered down here at the bottom of the blue. So we're kind of looking at less than a millisecond most of the time. Um, kind of seeing a fair few operations around two or three milliseconds. And then kind of what we're seeing here is, is a lot of these operations are then getting up to kind of six, seven, 10 milliseconds. Um, and we saw earlier we had transactions that were mostly taking six milliseconds, but then we're kind of adding up sometimes to, to maybe 30 milliseconds. And you can see how if you had a few of these kind of slower uh, dispatch to service spans, they would kind of add up and, and take the transaction to those kind of levels. So um, let's try and get Honeycomb to give us some insight into why some of these operations are slower. And Honeycomb has some very useful functionality that, that helps us out here a lot. It has this bubble up feature, um, which lets us just uh, draw a box around um, the slow operations that we're particularly interested in. Um, now, what Honeycomb is going to do is it's going to look at all those spans, and it's going to look at all the spans that are outside that box. And it's going to try and um, play spot the difference, really. It's going to look at the attributes on the, those spans, try to figure out why uh, why they're slow. So it's going to save us a lot of legwork and maybe even drop the answer right out. Um, so you have to sort of know how to interpret these graphs a little bit. These are each of the attributes that were on the spans that we saw earlier. Um, so most of this is not going to be particularly relevant. The trace ID, span ID, that's all open telemetry internals. Uh, these two graphs look a little bit interesting. Let's come back to those. Um, and then a lot of this stuff is identical. So all the operations are on the same bucket. So uh, most of this stuff is the same. So I th think what's jumping out here is really these graphs. So net.peer.name um, is the host name of the, of the Couchbase node we're going to under the hood. Um, this looks to be a four node cluster. And what this is actually telling us is that on this node, uh, node one, um, the orange box being a lot higher indicates that the, the orange box maps to the orange box that we drew around the spans. And what's that showing is that those spans are a lot slower. So I think this has actually identified the culprit pretty well. What we've got here is we seem to have, we don't know why, but what we have here is a, a node that's noticeably slower than the others. Let's see if we can just kind of do some group by and just double check our findings there. So let's have a look at the uh, average of duration, and then we're going to group by that field. And yeah, here we go. So if I go to the results tab, so pretty cl clear cut here. We've kind of got each of these colors is one of the nodes, and we've we've 
noticeably got this purple node here is is very clearly slower than the other three nodes in the system. Um, so at this point, we don't know why this node is slower, but this is still a lot of very useful information. In about five minutes, we've discovered that one of these nodes is slower, and now we can just rebalance this node out, um, and we can get this uh, cluster back up to the performance it should be. Um, and now in our own time offline, we can try and find out what, what's going on with that node. Um, so hopefully we've seen here just how powerful this new open telemetry uh, data can be. Um, it lets us take a look under the hood uh, and see what operations and transactions consist of, um, even down to the metadata level. Uh, and interesting enough as that information is, uh, more importantly, we can use that new insight to debug complex performance problems uh, in a way that just would have been much more challenging to um, before. As Graham mentioned, this actually comes from a real world scenario. So in advance, what I did is I went to Google Cloud Platform, uh, set up in Google Kubernetes engine, Couchbase actually running using the Couchbase autonomous operator inside Kubernetes. Uh, and I set up a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, that has an imbalance in the number of nodes to simulate a real world scenario. So in this particular case, you'll see that there is a pool called default pool that has three nodes and another pool that has one node in it. And if you look at the resources available to on the different nodes in the cluster, one of those has much less CPU uh, and um, less memory. But most importantly, actually, if you look into the details on that particular pool, and on the uh, node in that particular pool, you, you will see that uh, it has a uh, quite a bit less disk in that if you look at the details, it has, uh, instead of uh, the disk being SSD, it was set up with standard disk, so higher latencies. Uh, as mentioned, the, this comes from a real world scenario. In the real, in the actual scenario, what happened was, uh, the uh, user had a very large deployment running on physical hardware. And in their case, they had some SSDs that were wear leveling. And as SSDs wear level, they will start to have higher latencies. And their data set was so large that they had a certain amount of data that had to come off of those SSDs. So finding that sort of problem just is very, very difficult unless you have the kind of observability that open telemetry uh, on top of Couchbase with transactions gives you. So Graham was able to, within a matter of minutes, identify that there's something wrong with one of these nodes. And if we were to look a level deeper, we'd see that that particular Couchbase node is running on this particular Kubernetes node in the cluster. Good job finding that, Graham. That was a lot of fun. Um, we want to leave you with a couple resources. You can have a look at our documentation on transactions, both the Java and .NET library documentation. The Java library documentation covers how to set up open telemetry uh, for your choice of tracer. Uh, and then there's uh, some detail in the nickel transaction reference. And so with that, we want to thank you very much for attending this session. And again, if you haven't watched part one and you're interested in an introduction to Couchbase transactions, have a look in the agenda and you'll find part one for uh, this session. Thank you very much.